Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today I'm going to introduce you guys to ESUs. Now I've done a couple of videos on ESUs before, but I've never talked about the theory of operation. I've never showed you how it runs on the analyzer and how to diagnose some things if you have problems with the ESU. We're going to do that today. So I have here the QA ES3 analyzer. I've got the V-pad, which is from Daytrend, and I've got the old reliable DNI Nevada 454 Alpha. You can tell they're vastly different from one another. One of them, you have to be a qualified telephone operator. One of them, you have to have an iPad, and the other one, well, you just have to have two ports. <laughs> so, unfortunately, it is what it is. So guys, uh, here I've got a uh, Mega Power. I've got the um, Covidian FT10, and I've got the old reliable, the Covidian Force FX. All right, so I have a mixture of a little bit of everything because some of them have problems, some of them do not, and we're gonna use the analyzers to figure that out. And first off, let's start out what is an ESU. Electrosurgical units were invented a long time ago by a man named Dr. Bogey, and that's why to this day, people still refer to them as Bogies not a BOVI, it's an electrosurgical unit or an ESU. Biomed should not be calling it BOVIs. So, on a traditional ESU, we have monopolar and we have bipolar. Now, monopolar requires a pencil, which comes in a sterile pack like this. It's a disposable, one-time use unit, at least in the United States it is. Your pencil comes all nicely done up, and you have two functions. You have cut and coag. All right, and the only thing that it's doing is it's shorting your output to one of these two pins, and that is what's telling it to turn on. So inside this pin, all it's doing is shorting one wire or the other one together. So either these two or these two, all right? So that is a regular monopolar pencil, and they just connect in three pins, and there you go. But monopolar requires something else. The other side of a monopolar requires a patient return electrode, and there are two different types of patient return electrodes. You can see here on my decade resistance box, I've got both examples already set up. One of them's got a pin, and one of them doesn't have a pin. Now the one that doesn't have a pin, this one here is generally going to be really low resistance because it's going to be a single pad. All right, So it's looking for the resistance between the two pins when you plug it into the unit. And on most of the old units, like this one here, it's, it's looking for less than 10 ohms. So if you're hitting nine ohms and above, it will throw an error, which is the REM alarm right there. You see that? And this guy here is set at 11 ohms. This guy passes that test. But at 11 ohms, this one here has a pin. The pin is for a split electrode, and the split electrode is green because you should never have more than just a couple ohms on a single pad. That means that there's actually a defect in the pad. But a split pad is actually designed to monitor the resistance between each side of the pad, and it knows that by this little dongle right here, which goes in and activates a micro switch. So this guy plugs in, it's showing 10 ohms, 11 ohms. That is absolutely fine. And this here is the most important test that we do on an, on an ESU. You see, this is, gonna save the patient if there's ever a problem with uh, the electrode pad peeling up that reduces the surface area of the electrode because in monopolar it shoots from the pencil through the patient to the return electrode pad all right so you've got a fan pattern spreading out of electricity to the return electrode which is basically a ground and if that return electrode starts peeling up, you'll have less and less surface area, and that means all the electricity is concentrating on one zone of the human body, and that's gonna result in burns. So the surface area of an electrode is designed to disperse that electrical current that's passing through the body over a large surface area, which results in a dispersion of heat. So that is the REM system, or they call it the QR or whatever, what, is, what do these guys call it? The CQM is what Fluke calls it. But we just call it the return electrode or the ground pad. There's a little representation of the patient return on each one of these devices. And it's the most important thing that we test. Beyond the energy, 
the return electrode is absolutely everything because what it will do is as the resistance changes in the port, it will increase or decrease the electricity that comes out of your ports, usually decrease. So if your resistance starts going up, which means there's a peeling from the pad or a difficulty, then your ESU, they're all smart and they will start decreasing the amount of output RF energy from the ports. Okay, so this is the most important test that we do on any ESU. It's the patient return um, ohms monitoring. So for single pad, which is this guy here, you're looking for 10 and below ohms. At 10 ohms, you should definitely be getting an alarm. Now on some of the newer ones, they don't even care. They don't care. I mean, I can plug in 10 ohms on these ones and they'll show green. But on the old ones, back in the day, there used to actually be a difference in the pads and you can see it just goes dark and then it throws an alarm. So there is a difference and based on that is how you're gonna be testing your devices, okay? So let's proceed from there. You have a monopolar which requires the pencil and then uh, it's activated by the pencil usually or there's a foot control in the back of every single ESU. They have a foot control. Now you have bipolar and bipolar is one of the most common uses on any ESU it often resembles something like this, which is just a set of pliers and two banana plugs. And they just plug right in the front. Now the older devices were stupid and they didn't really care, but the newer devices, like this guy right here, if you take a look, there are actually buttons on your bipolar. So let's say you plug in one of your banana plugs and you don't plug it in all the way. Well, if you don't activate that button on the back wall, then you have no bipolar. It will never register. But if you plug it all the way in, it activates. You see that? So see what happens if I don't plug it all the way in? So when you're testing, that's one of the tests is actually, it's like a lockout feature. You make sure that the banana plugs recognize that they're plugged all the way in. Now bipolar is only activated with a foot control. But there's a secret to that. We can activate bipolar without the foot control using a generic paper clip. It's true. We can use a paper clip on an ESU. Let's take a look at the back of this guy right here. Now there is a triangular port for bipolar on every single one of these and by taking a paper clip and activating the top two pins it will activate the bipolar. Now this guy here notice how it didn't do anything. I showed you the micro switches on the port that both have to be pressed in in order for it to activate bipolar. That's a safety interlock. The old system doesn't have that. There is nothing connected to the front of this device and watch what happens when I plug this guy in. Now this is a low voltage signal. So I can safely do this with a paper clip. And often when I'm testing ESUs, they usually don't have foot controls with them. Mm -hmm. So we test the device using a paper clip or I have a on off button that I've made on my own accord. So but once it's hooked up to the analyzer, I can activate bipolar and then read my readings, then adjust the readings and then go to the next setting. So a paper clip can simulate a foot control safely. Now, now that you know the basics of ESUs, you're probably gonna notice that some of the ESUs look a little bit different. We do have two ports of monopolar, one port of bipolar, but this guy, this guy has something different. Take a look down here. We have a ligature slash bipolar port. Yes, it can do both functions. Ligature is a trade name and it's basically vein sealing. And in order to do vein sealing, we have a series of different hand tools. Vein sealing, what it is, is you will clamp down on a vein and it uses resistance measurements here in the jaws. And there's many different types of these utensils. They all have the same functionality. They have resistance monitoring in the jaws where it clamps down and it seals the vein with heat. And as you dehydrate tissue, it increases the resistance. So it knows based on the resistance when you're done. All right, it's kind of like auto dry function on your, on your uh, dryer at home. It knows when it's done. 
Now one of the things uh, you should know about every single one of these devices is there's a different method for activating the handpiece, okay? Here, it would register with a QR code. Notice there's also a dongle in the middle which activates some tiny little micro switches and then there's also this little pin right here which is a shorting pin to activate the bipolar energy because this is basically bipolar. It's bipolar that monitors resistance but it's still technically bipolar. Okay, because this one does not require there to be a grounding pad attached to the patient. Now most of these devices have an energy activation button and if you notice, like on these ones here, when I clamp these down, there's a two-stage button. So one stage, two stage. So as you clamp down on tissue, you automatically seal it all in one function. This guy has the QR code, also the little dingle hopper that activates the micro switch, the shorting pin, which activates the device. So when you come down and you click this, it activates the bipolar on its own, right? So you don't need the foot control. Over the years, the design has changed. This one here uses something called dot code. Notice there's two dots here. The camera that's inside the port, there is a camera in there, and sometimes it'll light up. I wonder if it will. The camera will pick up the dots and it knows what handpiece is connected. Now, see how it says an unknown instrument? This one, as you can tell, is an older one, and this works on like the Force Triad units. It does not work on the newer FT10s, but we still have some things in our inventory, so we have to try them. Inside, there's also an RFID tracker tag on some of these hand pieces. So it knows not only if the device has been used once before, but it knows what the hand piece is, what the software revision is supposed to be. So if you get an error code when you're trying to use one of these hand pieces with certain ones, check the software revision. I've had it so many times where they come out with a new design piece for an old piece and the software is not updated so every time they connect it it reads it and it says hey i don't know what that device is and it, it shuts off and it throws an error code so that's vein sealing in a nutshell it uses bipolar energy to seal the vein and in this case it also has an integrated knife now you can't see it the knife is right here and it's super sharp let's see if i can get a sheet of paper super sharp knife so when you clamp down on tissue you then hit the trigger and you can see it seals the tissue on both sides and then it dissects the tissue right in the middle. Very handy for doing veins if you're trying to remove certain tissue. So guys, that <laughs> is Ligature in a nutshell. We're not gonna test that because there's so many different ways of testing it. You should follow the book when it comes to testing those. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it we're just going to go over the functionality of these analyzers and how to test an ESU for function. We're not going to run through a PM, guys, but I'm going to show you how to test it for function. Now, I've done videos before on the QA ES3, and it's the one that I'm going to use. I really like the 454A and the DNI Nevada, not at all. But this guy here, uh, just because it does this auto feature, and the auto feature is... When you hit a button, it will activate the foot switch or it simulates activating the pen. You see that? So remember, I told you that it's shorting one wire to the electrode or the other wire to the electrode, which is how you get cut or coag. That's how it knows. This is only for monopolar. The ES3 can simulate the button press using banana plugs. Although, like I said, you have to be a qualified telephone operator in order to use it because look at this mess. And this is the unit that I designed a jig that fits in the front. And this is why, because unless you do this all the time, remembering which one plugs into what is insane. Now over here on the monopolar jack, this is very important guys, the color codes for the pins. Now I told you there's two pins over here and then there's one pin that's separate on each of the ports. So the red goes over here in the farthest port, but sometimes, especially with these fluke test leads, you can see it's, it's got this clear protective um, sleeve that fits over it. So you wanna make sure that you retract the sleeve by pressing down when you push it in, and it will recognize it. If this one is not seated correctly, then 
your foot switch activation on the QA ES3 will not work. All right, let's show you how I set it up for the QA ES3 to test out any of these devices with uh, the automated foot control function. You can see I've got cut and coag. Now, if you remember over here, I told you it's red, blue, and yellow. So the two over here are blue and yellow, and then the red's the separated pin. On the QA ES3, I've got yellow and blue, and then down here, you might not see it because I have them zip tied together. And I have that zip tied together for a reason because people lose cables. I have a short jumper cable that is going from common down here to variable high. You can see it's just plugged into the back of the variable high. It's just jumpered from here to here. And then I've got my red, which comes over to the monopolar. And then over here, the special thing about all the FT10s and the newer Cubidian series is there has to be a resistor that simulates the patient. Now, if I remember correctly, the original jig that came with the Fluke had a resistor in line with it, and that worked out fantastic. Where's that cable? I don't know. You tell me. I would love to figure out where that cable went. So what we can do is we simulate it with a power resistor. This is a, what, uh, 33 ohm resistor. This is a 5 watt resistor, so it can handle some energy. So I have a banana plug where the two wires are shorted together. That is connected to one of my gator clips, which is connected to one side of my power resistor. And the other side is the other pin, which runs to my patient return electrode. You can see right there. So that is basically what the pinout looks like. Now this is obviously probably not the safest way of doing it because I have open exposed metal surfaces, but notice I'm using a plastic table and I have a laminate floor. I just let these dangle down to the floor. They're not touching my chair. They're not touching me. I'm okay because there's nobody around me when I test ESU. So, for testing monopolar, you plug this one jack right here, the shorted banana plug, into CQM. So CQM's there. I have one other lead that is plugged into variable low. Don't even worry about that at this moment. I use these two leads right here when I am doing uh, variable resistance, that when I'm testing the ohms on this jack. This guy can do that. You use this dial over here and you run through the different ohms until it alarms. But I just like the decade box. It works better. It's very um, manual. It's very analog. I love analog things because there's a direct relation to what I'm doing and what I'm reading. Whereas this one here, you're trusting the readout versus what you got on the display. So I love using decade boxes. So you have other functions like start single and start continuous. Start continuous, if you are having problems with the ESU and the wattage jumping around, you can see we do measure in watts. So what I normally do is I have it set up and I run start single. So we're gonna start single. And over here on the device, you can see for two seconds, cause that's what I have it set at, for two seconds, it's going to activate at 300 ohms for monopolar, on most units it's 300 ohms. And it's gonna give me a reading. So that's for cut. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do coag, start single, activates for two seconds. And then over here you can see my output is 120 watts for coag. Now the only difference between cut and coag is the pulsing of the RF energy. ESUs use RF energy to heat up tissue, and as it heats up tissue, you can cut it uh, because a certain amount of heat, tissue is gonna fall apart. So that's basically what it's doing. For cut, it's a straight waveform. And for coag, it's pulse, stop, pulse, stop, pulse. That's what coag is. So basically, coag is for coagulating the blood and cutting some tissue, whereas cut is mainly just to get in there and cut that tissue. So. That's the two functions. There are a variety of different other waveforms that units can do, and that's what they always, they always sit here and try and sell people on a spray, coag one, coag two, micro. But usually when we test, we test it on pure cut and coag one. So let's go ahead and run through how I would test 
this guy here on the Q8 ES3. I've got it all set up, so all I have to do is activate it, which we just did for 300 and 120, and for a function check, not necessarily for the uh, PM, I'm gonna run through, I'm gonna do 200, and drop this guy down to 60, 260. I'm going to do start single. So 59.7, you can see here that I had it set at 60. Now I'm gonna depress the button for cut. Hit start single. Now you can see it's at 200 watts. I had it set for 200. This guy is doing fantastic. So next, I'm gonna go ahead and take it down a little bit more. Now I, I usually try and do half values. So half, 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 okay? So 130, start single. Look at that, 99.8, that's so awesome. Now we're gonna do coag. And as you can see, we can actually flip through stuff pretty quickly. 30.4, 30. 30. that's really good. So that's port one. Guys, once you test port one, now you gotta test port two. And as you can tell, this can be pretty rigorous. So we're gonna switch it over. Red, blue, yellow. And mono two, we're gonna take it all the way to the top. Now, guys, I've told you once before that when you're testing ESUs, always start from the highest wattage possible and work your way down because some devices, especially some of the old devices, used to have like analog dials and stuff, and some doctors still use those, and they, they have their preference on the wattage. So what happens is if you test it from the lowest to the highest, and you shut that machine off, when they come back, that analog gauge is gonna be exactly where you left it, which is gonna be on max. Whereas, if you start at the top and work to the bottom, then if you shut it off and you walk away and you forget to set it back where the doctor had it, he's gonna start using it instead of burning the hell out of somebody. It's just not gonna do enough and he's gonna shout at the nurse, hey, turn it up. That's no problem. At least then the patient's not injured, okay? So it's just a general habit. Any device that has either a motor or it distributes electrical energy to the patient to start at the highest and work your way down. So mono two, we're at 300 and 120. I'm just gonna go ahead and start single on cut. Coag, start single. Okay, now I'm gonna go half value. So 300, I'm gonna take it down to 150. 120, 60. Cut, start single. You can see how fast this can really go once you get into your rhythm. Look at that, 59.7. So this guy's working excellent. Now let's get on to the bipolar. We are gonna convert this guy over to run bipolar. So in order to run bipolar, after I've tested monopolar one and monopolar two, that's when I disconnect my wires. And now what we need to test bipolar is two of your jumpers. So let's say I'm gonna do yellow and uh, red. We're gonna connect these in. And remember, you have to depress the buttons on the front. So just like that. And I'm going to take my yellow and red over here, and we are going to plug one into CQM and the other one into variable high. Okay. Next thing in order to test bipolar, we have to adjust the load because 300 ohms is for monopolar. Now we are going to be doing bipolar. So we have to take it down. For this guy here, it's going to be 100 ohms. Many of them use bipolar at 50 ohms. This one is gonna be 100. Now, I told you guys that you can use a paper clip to short the terminals on the back to activate it if you're in a bind. When you're not in a bind, always keep a bipolar foot control on your service cart, ready to rock and roll, because it's just gonna save you the hassle. Just screw it onto the back, you place it down at your feet, you have your Q8 ES3, I told you there's two different options on the front. One of them is start single and one of them start continuous. We are gonna use start continuous. So it activates the load, it's running, it's waiting for an input. Now you just depress the foot control and you can see I've got my display set at 70 watts. So I should be expecting something close to that. So press the foot control and hold it a couple seconds. 
and you can see that my power output is 69.9 watts. That is almost as good as it possibly gets. So we are now gonna go and by the rule of half value, we're now gonna take it down to about half. And I'm gonna activate the foot control again. Look at that, 34.6 out of 35. Again, I'm gonna take it down. Activate the foot control, 19.7. Let's take it down again, half value. Activate the foot control, 9.9 .9 watts. And again, we're gonna take it down, half value, five watts, 4.9. So that is certifying your bipolar. Your bipolar test is done on the Q8 ES3. And now you can play telephone operator again and plug all that garbage back in. Now, on the Daytrend mono over here, it does have one large advantage. It tells you with a picture how they want you to play telephone operator. But the problem is, is this one here, the tablet, is, you, look at this, it's floating around. Maybe it would be convenient since this model here, we can activate the foot control using the included adapter cable. Just one more thing, dingle hopper off the front, but it is kind of cool, you just screw it in. Um, it's test your ports on the back, to which most of mine testing with the pen function on the front does not test those ports, but that's okay. On this tablet here, it's very bright, very vibrant. You can see that you can adjust your load. I, as I told you, 300 ohms is traditional for monopolar. Bipolar can be either 50 ohms or 100 and we can adjust that right through here. Also, you're gonna be selecting whether you're gonna do bipolar or monopolar, and it shows you how to adjust your configuration. This one here is an excellent device to use with Biomed 1s or Junior Biomeds because it shows you exactly how they want you to hook it up. Just be sure that you don't lose your cables that come with the unit, because if you do, now you gotta play senior level Biomed and you gotta make up jigs as you've seen me do here. Now let's get to my favorite. My favorite is the good old trusty 454 Alpha. And in order to test these guys, usually what I will do is I have this guy here with the uh, pen and this guy here, which is your patient return, shorted together. And we are gonna go ahead and hook it up to this Megadyne. And this one here is going to be monopolar one. You can see I've already got it set for 300 and 120. Start at the top and work your way down, as I said. We're on pure coag one. And I come over to the analyzer. We're going to go into manual mode, which is this button right here. I love physical buttons, guys. And output. So we're going to do output test. You can see it starts out with a load at 500 ohms. As I said, we adjust the load. It's the number one thing that you're going to be doing when you're testing these. We're doing monopolar since you're using the pencil, so we need it at 300 ohms. We set the pencil up, and I actually depress it down into the bottom so you get a really good contact. And then you activate the pencil. 300 watts over there, and you can see right here, live, look at that refresh rate. See how fast it's refreshing? I got 295, 300. What I traditionally do is I record the highest value that it possibly outputted that I can read. So that one there would be 301 point something. Then I switch over to coag on the pencil. And I've got 119.8 watts, 120.2. Okay, 120.2 .2 is what I would record. And that is monopolar. Very simple, you gotta love how vibrant the screen is, it's really nice. Next, we're gonna test bipolar on this guy. And to test bipolar, there's a couple different ways you can do it. One of the easy ways to de test bipolar, let me move my foot control over to the next unit. That's the delightful thing about these units is that the bipolar, monopolar foot controls are usual universal on their pinout, so you can just move your foot control from one unit to the next when you're testing. So now my bipolar foot control is hooked up to the Mega 9. Yep, it's ready to go. 
I have it set at the top, which on this guy is 80 watts. And now what we're gonna do is we are gonna set up using the bipolar tweezers. So some guys, especially some of the old timers, they always kept bipolar tweezers on them. Now these ones here do not have the pin or the buttons that detect if you're plugging anything in. It's stupid. And as you heard, I just pressed the foot control and it activated because there's no lockout. So you're gonna take the tweezers and we are gonna stuff them down into RF input ports one and two, which is active and dispersive. And we are gonna adjust the load. So as I said, the load on many units is gonna be either 50 or 100. So we're gonna do it at 100 ohms. I'm gonna hold the tweezers down in there and I'm gonna activate at 80 watts. And you can see I'm getting 76, 77 watts. I'm 77.1 watts. That's excellent. So then I'm gonna decrease my wattage. Let's do it down to 60. I'm gonna activate. 56.6 is what I got. I'm gonna decrease it again. thirty seven point seven watts so here's the thing is if you have it on the wrong load let's say I decrease the ohms it's going to affect your power output As you can tell right there I'm getting twenty nine point six watts at fifty ohms so it actually decreased the power because I'm currently at forty on my machine over there so if you're ever reading off on your outputs check to make sure that your load is correct. Read your user manual. Here, you can tell I'm at 50 ohms. I'm gonna increase it to 100 ohms. Now, let's see, before I was getting 30 watts. Look at that, I'm getting 37.8 watts. Big difference, that's like 25% difference just by going up or down 50 ohms on my load. So guys, that is pretty much it. ESUs are kind of simple devices. They use RF energy to cut tissue, and the newer ones have vein sealing. And remember, vein sealing is bipolar. You have energy on one side of, the, of your tweezers, and you have energy on the other, and all it does is it monitors the resistance of the tissue as it burns the tissue, so it knows it gets a really good seal. That's technically vein sealing in a nutshell. So guys, ESUs, don't be intimidated by them. Use your user manual when you're doing PMs. This is just a brief overview of how you hook it up. The Dave Trend is probably the best unit if you are not used to testing ESUs. If you're more experienced, the Flute QA ES3 is awesome. And if you're old school and you like just getting fast results, the 454 Alpha is where it's at. If I'm going out there and I'm pounding out a whole bunch of PMs, I'm either gonna use this guy, or as you guys seen in one of my other videos, I actually made an adapter that plugs into the front of this guy, and I can quickly go between bipolar, monopolar, etc. Works awesome. But the Q8 ES3, it's also a pretty good choice. It's just the display is ancient. And as you see, the numerics are terrible compared to what you get on these guys. Here's what it is, guys. ESUs, they're simple. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave them down below. I'll try and answer your questions the best I can. These are the staple. If you're doing surgical or if you're doing any type of outpatient procedural area, you're going to have ESUs of some sort. Thank you very much for watching.